Hey y'all, it's the Kentucky Renaissance man, and we are in Decatur, Alabama, working on a Pond Spring Joe Wheeler Plantation building, outbuilding. It's one of the old houses, log houses, it's a dog trot, and it was built in the mid 1800s. And we are getting ready to do the chinking on this cabin, and we recently restacked this pen that's behind me. The other side, we did a bunch of log replacement and restoration work. And we've got a new roof on it and we are putting flashing underneath the pier. We will share with you our steps as we go along here and incorporate some of the other work that we've already done. On an antique log cabin, they would hand hew the logs and part of the byproduct of, of hewing the cabin logs was you would get these chunks of, of wood that would come out of the, the gullets, I guess, between the uh, between on the cuts when they were hewing the face off. They would have piles and piles of these and then sometimes they would use rocks brick. Uh, sometimes they use old grapevines and twist them in here. And then the daubing is the mortar that goes on the front of it. And so this is chink blocks and we put them inside here. And you get them in however you can. You can see this layer that we've done here um, is real flat and thin so it's very, you know, it's hard to get them in. You just jam them however you can. Up here the joints are almost nothing so just slide them in and jam them however you can. But on this joint where it's wider you actually start um, with a single block and then sometimes maybe a piece on the end and then put one in at a 45 and when you put pressure on it these get tight right there and so then we'll just continue to add blocks to it wedging them as we go and you put it in and put a little downward pressure spring on it Sometimes if one works a little better than another one, you can back off of them and put another block in. Every once in a while, tap them up tight until they're good and tight where you can trowel mortar in. And we're working from the outside of the cabin first. It's more important to get the outside where our mortar can lean back and the, mortar, the water can drain off when we get our mortar in. So we're watching this reveal and making sure that it's far enough back so when we put our, our uh, daubing in, the daubing will be a half to three quarters of an inch back and then down flush to the top edge here. And so we'll just continue this process on down through here, jamming a block in, tapping it up, keep it to where it's got enough spring you can get the next block in. And as you go, you're creating a whole bunch of little triangles and odds and ends areas that the mortar can get up in there around it, cling to it. Where these have been hand split, uh, there's a lot of rough edges to it. So the, the rough edges are conducive to giving it a million little fingers for the blocking to grab onto. Eventually that stuff gets pretty, pretty tight in there. And here I'm getting close to the bottom of my joint, uh, a tight part on the joint. And I can't really wedge that in, so just jam a block in there. And then when I get to the end down here, I'll have to cut a piece or just find a smaller piece to fit in there. And that's how we get the blocks in. Go back and just adjust them. And then if you walk here on the inside, I don't know if the light's good enough in here. So this is the inside of the joint we just did. Um, and you can see, we just check and make sure our, our daubing will lay you back, which it will. And we'll fill all this in with mortar or with daubing. So our daubing is a, we'll do a little bit on it in a minute, but it's a mixture of lime and uh, sand and uh, white Portland cement on this project. It was a, the particular formula we're using here is uh, in our spec sheet from the state of Alabama for this project. Uh, it varies a little bit from project to project, but we're typically on a historic project that's owned by the state or the federal government. They'll have a spec from the Secretary of Interior Standards that we'll use. 
If we were doing this for a customer on a, cu on a modern house, we'd be using wire lad stapled in, and I'll do a video on that uh, pretty soon because we got a couple of them that we're prepping on another job right now. But it would be wire lad that we'd use in, le in lieu of wood blocks. We would use that for our chinking. So it's chinking wire with daubing over it. And the wire lad would do the same thing. We would form three quarters of an inch back out to this leading edge of the lower log and uh, come back out here where it's more light and I'll show you again. So instead of wood blocks, we would staple wire in back here and out to the front edge and we would follow this leading edge with wire. So I'll do a video on that another time, but then our daubing would go on and we would trowel it on. So that's the chinking block process. Uh, we'll do some more footage of it and include it here in the video. Hang on. Hey y'all, it's Kentucky Renaissance Man, and I got Larry here with me. He is, where are you from, Larry? I'm originally from Chattanooga, Tennessee. He's from Chattanooga, Tennessee, but he got stuck in Alabama somehow. But anyway, <laughs> and he's here working for Hobitar and working on this project with us. And right now, Larry is in charge of putting copper on top of all these uh, columns. Yeah, you're gonna get us in, in trouble for copyright with that music running around here. <laughs> anyway, so hey, Yahoo number one, say hello. Uh oh, anyway, this is Derek. Derek is helping Larry put copper on these piers, and right now we're going around putting these chink blocks in. We've got some replacement chink blocks put in. We have the old original chink blocks that we're putting in, tightening them up, and all those have to be done before we can get the mortar in between the logs. And so then after the mortar's in, you can see this cabin was whitewashed originally. So we'll go back and put whitewash on there. And uh, you can see they literally whitewashed the stone, they whitewashed the logs, the chinking, the whole entire house will be white inside and out, top to bottom. So we were here a few months ago and had to restack the whole log cabin and do a bunch of epoxy repair work and some consolidation, restack some of the piers. The logs were in really bad shape. Hadn't done any maintenance here in years and I uh, had let it go pretty bad. I actually worked here 20 something years ago on this project and uh, had it in pretty nice shape. I'll include a picture of a before picture from 20 years ago when we left. And, and then um, and then we got some pictures of what it looked like when we got here back in May and then some pictures when we left um, that we'll incorporate and then I'll show you the process of where we had to actually take one whole pin completely down to the subfloor and restack it and we brought in some replacement logs from an antique log cabin that were um, that we reclaimed from another cabin that wasn't able to be salvaged as a whole cabin so we used those parts of that cabin to replace this with like kind material so anyway, uh, in fact, here's one of them right here where we patched in a log and continued it because the end of it was rotted. They had built a handicap ramp up through here and the handicap ramp had splashed water up on this stuff and rotted a bunch. And you can see some of the deterioration right in through here. And we ran a consolidant epoxy uh, all up on top of this and hardened it up. I mean, that stuff's like glass now. And uh, so it looks a little rough, but it's a, we were able to, to keep all of the original historic fabric that we could so that uh, the original logs were maintained intact. And um, all of this is getting whitewashed. So where we put this uh, e-wood on the ends of these logs and filled in some of this stuff, it'll all be whitewashed and you won't be able to tell that 90% of it is there when we get done. But generally the logs are pretty sound shape. It's a uh, two-pin cabin with a dog trot breezeway through the middle and had a sleeping lofts upstairs. Um, had, of course, exterior doors coming out several places. And then uh, had these V-shaped gutters that were added sometime in the 30s or 40s. And uh, they've been replaced two or three times, I'm sure. And so we hung the gutters back up from 20 years ago that we had made. This fireplace has been recreated, um, for lack of a better word. The fireplace had been built probably back in the 30s or 40s. 
and then the brick work we did uh, 20 something years ago uh, and then of course this last go around a few months ago we built the gables and uh, reframed the roof and then had to put a cedar tree roof up on the uh, on the top and see the chicken tail rooster tail whatever you want to call it up there uh, on the top for a ridge and uh, there's these other outbuildings there's the back side of the actual pond spring house and then this was the farm office over here this little white building and uh, and this was a i guess a servants quarters or slave quarters some kind of a a uh, outbuilding residential it might have even might have even been the original house that the that the family built when they moved here um, i'm not sure that they actually know here on site but um, but it's been here for a long time. It's been preserved, and uh, so that's what the job we're doing is trying to preserve it for the next generation to enjoy and come visit and uh, be able to tour and learn learn about our history. So I hope that uh, gives you a, kind of an overview of what we're doing, trying to save uh, save history one one log at a time, one little piece at a time. It's a lot of work, tremendous amount of labor. Um, to be able to, to preserve old stuff and keep it. But uh, but I think it's worth it. I think that, uh, you know, the money and the time and the effort and the knowledge and the, the uh, capacity to be able to do it is a blessing and um, that hopefully people appreciate it. I don't mean to get way off subject, but uh, people come from all around to look at these historic homes and historic projects and I'm glad we're able to to be a part of that to some degree but anyway so we're finishing up putting these chink blocks in i was explaining earlier that these are original pieces of the hand hewn logs that are saved um, in that process and then they're shoved in between the logs and then the daubing goes over the top of that and so uh, we as part of this video i'll i'll show the process of how we'll mix up the mortar um, daubing it's a portland cement and hydrated lime and sand mixture that was well, required by the state uh, and he included that document from the secretary of interior standards um, requirements so that's what we're going to use uh, typically we use a type n mortar and whatever color a customer wanted mixed with sand mixture pretty weak sand mi mixture so that it stays malleable and then, uh, and that gives it, uh, and we put it on a screen wire, but man, this is a actual historic home that we're preserving, keeping exactly the way it was. We'll use uh, similar materials to what they had available to them then. The, uh, a lot of the old log cabins would have actually used uh, clay and lime um, and other natural mud type materials, grass, they would have cut up chopped up grass. I've taken a lot of old daubing out that had, uh, you know, just real stiff grass pieces in it. And then I've also taken daubing out that had hog hair in it. A lot of people think it's horse hair, but they had, when they, when they would boil hogs every fall and um, when you scald the hogs, all the hair off those old heritage breeds would come to the top and they could just collect it, scattered out on a sheet and dry it for a few days and then bag it up and then use it for reinforcement. So they used hog hair like we use fiberglass today and they would mix it up in their mortar as a binder and it would um, it would lace all up in the in the minerals in the sand in the mortar um, and reinforce the mortar and help it bind together so when we put the mortar in um, we're gonna lay, put it up inside here and it's gonna grab on all these little odds and end holes and uh, rough edges and stuff and that uh, that will allow the the mortar to cling to all these odds and end edges. And of course, we'll run the mortar kind of the angle my finger is right here. It'll go from this bottom edge to three quarters or an inch back from the top at an angle. So that way, when water drips, it'll drip off this edge onto there, run down the log, drip off the edge, and continue on down. So that's the process. Here's a row of chink blocks done there, a row done in here. Some of these are real flat. You can't get you can't get them in at an angle, but we get them in as tight as possible.
Use your heel, use the back, use the front, use the tip, whatever it takes. You just scrape the face like that. You don't want to smear it down on your lower log. So the tools you need for basic chinking, whether it's on wire lath or on wood blocks, is some kind of a metal or plywood board to put your stockpile of mud on your horses or your scaffold. You need a couple of hawks, at least one hawk if you're working by yourself, two hawks if you got a helper to load them up for you. And a hawk is just a piece of metal with a wood handle you can make your own. Or uh, you can use a piece of wood. Um, a large trowel like this, they call a block trowel, is good for just scooping up and stirring your pile, but you never want to use that for chinking. We always use small brick trowels like this. Uh, I prefer a wood handle, but there's these new ones with rubber handles. But a small brick trowel um, is only four or five inches and fits the joints really well. Another thing I do is I, as soon as I buy one, I take a grinder and I thin the metal up to almost 50%. If you look at the edge of that, it is razor sharp and really thin and flexible. And I do that all the way to the back end. Uh, take the grinder around the tip of it to where it's rounded instead of a sharp point like when you buy them. And also round the corners of the shoulders uh, so that it flows over the edges of the wood a lot better. It makes it a lot better. Here's another one that I ground even a little bit more round. I never use a, a build um, duck bill trowel which is where they're square snub nose i always like these points because the points work up into the edges really well anyway that right there is all the tools you need other than a mixer or a wheelbarrow or a shovel or something like that and uh you can do your chinking project so over here we have our portland cement and this particular job is white portland cement and then we have hydrated lime and then of course we have our natural sand so what we're gonna do to show you how to figure out your proportions um, when you're mixing your mix is uh, Darnell is going to take a shovel and put one really good scoop of sand in this bucket. Um, our mixture is one part hydrated lime, I'm sorry, two parts hydrated lime, one part Portland cement, and eight parts sand is what they call for. So anyway, what he's gonna do is he's gonna shovel up uh, a normal shovel full like he would put into the mixer, which is a heaped up shovel. Go ahead. And then we're gonna look in the bucket and we're about a quarter. So go ahead and put two parts in there so we'll know exactly how much sand and cement. Okay, so when you level the bucket up, then we can just use the bucket so we're almost exactly a half a bucket right there so now we know that when we put the either the lime or the portland cement into a bucket uh, to get two parts we just put a half a bucket so that way we're not shoveling that because when you shovel hydrated lime or shovel portland cement out of the bag you don't get near as much as you do with sand by volume so because it doesn't stack up on your shovel as well so this allows us to shovel the sand directly into the mixer and then be able to just pour hydrated lime into a bucket until we have a half a bucket and then fill the rest of the bucket up with Portland cement and then just dump the whole bucket in there at one time. And so then let the mixer mix it up and we add our water. As far as water goes, you know, they have technical ways of figuring out exactly how much water you need but your sand holds a certain amount of moisture, your cement and your lime is completely dry. And then depending on the humidity and the temperature and everything else, we usually start with about, a, about two, three gallons of water in the bottom of the mixer. We get it going, we add our sand to it. 
you can see we've already got some clean water in there then we'll add our sand and let it be mixing it and you can usually tell from the sand and the water about how you're going to finish out once you add that really dry five gallon bucket full of mortar and hydrated lime what you'll end up with is uh, it'll wick the moisture out really quick and it will actually stall your mixer out if you uh, don't have enough water so we always uh, as a rule keep a bucket of water really close to the mixer and then immediately start trickling in very slowly allowing the mixer to use the water we'll trickle it in really slowly i'm going to film the whole process here while he's mixing um, then we'll test it with our trowel make sure that it's going to be laying like we want but when you're adding water be very careful to add the water slowly so that you allow the mixer to do its job a lot of times people will dump more water and it looks dry they add more water but then as the mixer stirs it up um, it hasn't contacted all of the uh, materials in there and so then it gets really soupy quick so it's easy to over add water all right let's go dardo We mix it just a little bit softer in the beginning because it starts to lose and dry out really quick. And uh, this works really well for the narrow, the narrow spots. But you wanna be able to slick it off with the back of your trowel fairly easily. And you want it to be sticky enough that it'll stay on your trowel when you pick it up. If it doesn't stay on your trowel, you can't hardly work it. So you wanna be able to put it on the back of your trowel to, put it, to present it up to a joint. And so that's what we're looking for. It's a nice set of mud. All right, so when I'm putting mud in, don't overwork the mud. Lay your pieces in and leave it, and then we'll come back and stack on top. You guys are keeping the mud on the board right behind me so I can just scrape it off real fast on my hawk while they're working on chink blocks. So I showed you how to put mud this way and then double stack it. But another effective way, depending on the width of your joint, is to stack it in like that and run your point all the way up like this and stack them beside each other and overlap and pull straight down. You're actually cleaning the bottom of your trowel off right on that leading edge. Then we'll stack across the top of it. loaded in there come back across on this heel right along that bottom pushing up and in as you go smash that stuff in one more time right into your block continue that all the way down your joint following that bottom edge may pull away at the top and it's okay on that pass and we'll come across the top using our tip and this edge let it follow it 
it'll pretty well create your hole. I'll show you is right up here along this top edge. You can just very lightly touch that. And when you scrape these crumbs back, if you tease this, sometimes it'll sag down, sometimes it won't. But you see this little bitty crack right there, just barely take your trowel and just touch it and it'll seal that up. And when you leave it alone, it will stay there until it dries. If you come down and do the next joint and you look back up in that sag a little bit, you can just barely touch that top edge and just lay it over and let it seal up. And then that way, with the crumbs gone, afterwards, if you have a few crumbs, you take a wire brush and wire brush this and then run a bead of like GeoSeal or Lexel along that top edge and that'll seal the mortar to the log so that water can't get back in there. What it should look like tucked up underneath all the way across there. This is the inside of the chink blocks now with the mortar on the outside. And you can see how it squishes in. Let me get it a little closer. It squishes in around all the blocks. Kind of keys into it. Right, right here, you see where it's on there? Stuck pretty good. So now we'll come on the inside, chink all this up, or daub it all up from the interior. All right, good morning. This is the Kentucky Renaissance man. We are here in Decatur, Alabama, working on this old Joe Wheeler plantation log home restoration. And uh, what I wanted to show you all is where we chinked yesterday. Uh, come back this morning and all this is nice and hard and uh, ready to go. And so everything is, is uh, ready for us to chink the inside. But what I wanted to do was take my trowel around and show you these little crumbs. I think y'all can see them right in here. And what we'll do is we just take our trowel, take the point of the trowel and just run it along the top edge. And then see these little crumbs on the bottom. Uh, let me see if I can get it on my trowel here. We'll just take and scrape the bottom of that with our trowel and just knock all that loose part right off of there. So that's how we cleaned all the all the little miscellaneous stuff up and get it ready for finish. You don't want any of these crumbles up there because that's the that's the first thing that falls off um, and weakens your whitewash and your other material. So this morning we're gonna start here on this wall with these new chink blocks and uh, the boys have my scaffold set up. And so we're gonna do this wall hopefully and the back wall, or this is the back wall. We're gonna do this wall and the front wall opposite side of it today. So that just in case if it rains next week, we come back, we're not working under the gutters because there's nothing more miserable than having water dripping down your shirt uh, while you're there. All right, so we are going to chink the tops of these up here between the joists this morning, first thing. And I don't know if you can see, but we have to put nails up from the bottom and the top to be able to grab our mortar uh, because of the way this is laid out. There's not a good way to put blocks up in here. And so we put the, once the mortar's in here like this, it'll grab around all these nails and keep it together uh, where it won't come out. And then when we chink the inside, it'll do the same thing. So down below, we've got chink blocks on all the joints all the way to the bottom. Another thing I haven't uh, discussed, we always start chinking at the top of our cabins and work our way down, almost always unless we have some repair or something we're doing. But when we're doing a full chinking on here, we'll start at the top and put all of our mud in and detail it completely out and then work our way down in one section at a time. I try and do, if I have a continuous joint, I like to do the whole joint from one end to the other, but I don't wanna you know, come across and stop if there's not a good natural stopping point. Like here, we can stop at this timber that comes out and we can pick up tomorrow if we wanted to and continue down. But from this window here to the end of the cabin, what I don't want to do is run out of mortar or daubing and then have to come back and 
and stop halfway and have a cold joint right there that's really hard to blend in. So what we'll do is we'll do this whole joint here from end to end, uh, then we'll move down to the next joint and we'll go end to end and down to the next joint, end to end. And two reasons that we do top to bottom. One, you're adding thousands of pounds of daubing uh, to the cabin and so uh, you get just a little bit of settlement and so if you put all your weight on the top first it'll squish everything down as you go so that you're adding more weight to the bottom. If you start at the bottom and chink up you put the weight down low but then as you add more weight on the top it's the same day especially if you're doing it with several guys and you're putting mud on both sides you can add two or three thousand pounds to one wall and that two or three thousand pounds on this wall can actually uh, crack or push out the chinking down on the lower. So that's one reason. The other reason is because of the mess it makes. So as we're chinking the top and you're dripping chinking, if you've got a nice finished face of a joint below that you've already done, then and it leans out like this, then when stuff falls, the crumbs and, and stuff falls and splatters, it'll splat down on top of that and mess up and you're constantly having to go back and touch it up. Well, eventually, if you've worked from the bottom up sometimes at bottom you were there five six hours before and it's already set up and then you're dropping fresh mortar down on top of it and splattering everywhere if you start the top then your splatters may hit a log down below but you can clean that up real quickly as you go and uh, so right before you start the next joint if there's some splatter here you can just scrape it off do your next joint and you don't have any worry about stuff falling down on top of it so we'll start today up here at the top do these top joints and then I'll do all the way across do all these then I'll work this section down then I'll get on the other side of the window here and work that section down then I'll move my scaffold and then I'll do all the long joints down the bottom that I can do standing right on the ground. In the upper 50s, it takes a while for it to do anything. To really get hard. The chemical reaction starts though, as soon as you mix it. Like I tell my boys, life is like, life is like concrete. You only have so much time to do something with it. So, you gotta stay with this. When you got fresh mud made up, do your job. It'll be time for visiting and discussing and figuring out, planning when you don't have mud made. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars were the perilous flight for the ramparts we won. Was so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star spangled banner yet wave? O'er the land of the free And the home of the brave 
My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I see. Land where my fathers died, land of its pilgrim pride, o'er every mountainside, let freedom ring.